Is there any weighting within the initiative that prioritizes one of the goals over the others? The, in my view, all of them are important in poor countries. And, uh, but the driver is really access. Giving people energy is crucial. I always make the joke that my aunt in the village or my mother, when she's in the village, she doesn't care about the color of the energy. She needs energy because she doesn't have it to begin with. However, having said that, we know that with renewable energy today, you don't have to wait for the grid. You can do a mini grid for 600 kilowatts or a megawatt in a community within a year, year and a half. The big projects, the big dam, 200 megawatts, maybe it's five, seven, eight years. Our argument is to achieve access, you can do off-grid, mini-grid today quickly. So people don't wait in darkness for the big mega project, which might also be delayed because of all kinds of risks that I mentioned. So if you look at it, access is not necessarily separate from renewables. In some of those communities in Africa, they have biomass. You know what my people do in the village? They just burn it on the farm. Well, in India and other Asian countries, they collect it and they gasify it. They make it into a gas which goes into a generator that produces energy for the village. I'm testing one in my village now. They do it in China. In, in those communities in Asia, they're using the waste from humans and animals to generate methane, which they use in a generator to supply energy. So today, biomass is not waste anymore. It is a source of energy because it has organic matter. So in that sense, if it's in my village, I would weigh renewables even higher than access. Why? If I can do those simple technologies on gasification, if I can use the waste in the community to generate methane, the women get gas for cooking, I generate power, they get access. You see what I mean? They're not separate. It depends on your community. In Latin America, their interest is efficiency. In Europe, we are driving efficiency and renewables. Why? They have the cash today, the technology, and the consumers that are ready to pay, hopefully, to change their energy mix so they don't cause more emissions for the rest of the world. So my point is, the, we, our narrative is access, efficiency, and renewables as a package. The degree of weighting is up to the country. I'll give you another dimension. In the poor countries, and I'm sure uh, uh, Ofid has data on this, in some of their power generation today, they lose 20 to 30% of the power. Inefficient generating systems, inefficient transmission. I know countries in Europe where some of them already the wastage is 15%. So we always argue that perhaps your first energy is the energy efficiency, the energy you save. Because you're not wasting it, it goes into the power line. And by simply changing the light bulbs, you generate less, you save more. So you look at it, none of them are separate because, again, that's the beauty of sustainable energy for all. And that's what people tell me. They say we do projects in the countries, we just do electrification. We don't look at the efficiency because it can help us with demand, which means we generate less and we get savings to do something else. So the beauty of our narrative is that it's all three. In every country, each of those pillars are relevant to different weighting, but it's up to the country to decide which one is more important. You've established a framework for tracking progress towards the three goals of the initiative. Are there any early indications which, if any of the goals, is showing better progress? All of them are showing promising progress in different countries. Um, you look at access, China and Brazil, Vietnam, South Africa are wonderful case studies of how fast you can give access to countries. In each of those cases led by government. In Brazil, it's electricity for all. In China, it's various programs and they use all means, biomass, microgrid, you name it. But it's any means where the community has the resource. Wind, biomass, you name it, small streams. Vietnam also government led, South Africa same. Now, you, you flip that over, you take efficiency, you look at Denmark, you look at Japan and others. Denmark economy grew, almost doubled over the last 40, 50 years. The energy use stayed the same or declined. One of the best countries to show, show decline of energy intensity. The Swedes are not far, the Norwegians are not far, nor are the Japanese. 
Can the rest of Europe do the same? In other words, what is the message from the Nordics, one of the best quality of life in the world? They're saying, look, you can grow your economy, you can live better than anybody in the world. The, the Danes are the happiest in the world, according to surveys. But you can also reduce your energy use, and it doesn't reduce your lifestyle one bit. So you can be wealthy, prosperous, but you can reduce your energy use over time and make it even uh, uh, cleaner if you want it. Now, you look at renewables. Our great Austria, a lot of the electricity from renewables, uh, uh, hydropower, because they have water. So my point is, when we look at the tracking over time, we see these signs of progress and hope. That in fact, there are countries in poor countries, in rich countries, where we can show examples of what is possible. Bhutan. One of our dream countries now is Bhutan. We believe, I just came back from the Asian Development Bank, we say, hey, can we take Bhutan as one of our case studies? Can we help Bhutan? Because Bhutan is doing all three correctly. Small country is not one of the giants with a lot of money. We say, can we help Bhutan in 20 years to achieve all three goals fully? And they're on the course by their own effort. Because in their own context, energy security is crucial. They can't afford to pick and choose between sources. And they're doing everything right. So the tracking report, just to emphasize that, we imposed it on ourselves. We say we've launched an initiative. Everybody says they're happy about it. Can we keep ourselves honest? Who is us? Us is the global community. Every two years, led by 15 agencies, the best energy institutions in the world, led by International Energy Agency, World Bank, and others, we put knowledge together and we ask ourselves every year, are we on track? Who is doing well? What can we learn from each other? Ah, what is the new risk mitigation instrument that our partners tested in this country. Uh, what did this government do that makes suddenly they have more access than the other? Uh, who connected more hospitals than the other? Who provided more energy to women? By the way, we've not talked about cooking solutions. Who gave the women more clean cooking solutions so they're saving lives? That's an important part of our initiative. In fact, uh, it's January 2014 is the beginning of the decade of sustainable energy for all. So in fact, we're going to make the first theme of the first year or maybe the first two years, we're still debating is whether it's one or two years, the theme will be energy and women, why? We know today based on studies by uh, uh, WHO and Lancet Journal and many other institutions, we have four million premature deaths due to household air pollution from the use of biomass and other sources of energy that pollutes. 70 to 80% are women and children. It's the number two killer of women, it's the number four killer in the world. Mm -hmm. So we know today giving clean cooking solutions, clean energy within the home, we, say, we could save four million lives a year. That number is almost double HIV AIDS and malaria combined. So you begin to see lack of energy as a killer of people. Number four killer in the world, number two killer of women. But not to talk about the burden on women. 20 hours a week collecting firewood and water. But at the same time, in my village, the women process food with their hand. They pound the rice. They collect the firewood on their head. So they're the beast of body. And in fact, they're the substitute for lack of energy. The women suffer the most. They're the ones providing the bulk of the energy. Collect water for the husband to wash. Collect it to cook. Then you come and cook and you have the fumes. So you see my drive. I see this all the time. So when I leave Vienna, the wonderful city of Vienna where everything is given, beautiful city, clean air. I go back to my village as I'll be doing in the next few weeks. I go there just to get the reality and come back pumped up to work with Suleiman El Harbish and others who say, let's change the world. The World Bank came on board the initiative earlier this year. What difference does it make having them alongside you? Major difference. It's the first time in the UN and the World Bank history that the president of the World Bank and the Secretary General are leading something together themselves. And they've made it clear. The World Bank president says poverty and climate change are our biggest challenges of the world. Central to both is, 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 is dealing with energy. The Secretary General says energy is the golden thread that runs through sustainable development. So you see both of them. But what is unique here is both of them are joining hands to lead it and putting their institutional power and their convening power. World Bank has the finance ministers, the planning ministers, who can help change the enabling environment in countries together with their presidents. We in the UN system, we also deal with the leaders of the world, the presidents. How do we bring those convening powers, economic and political, 
to get the right conditions in place to deal with energy poverty on the one hand, but at the same time energy transitions. Helping the advanced countries also know that look, the way you use and produce energy for around the world is also creating problems. Climate change is a major risk multiplier. And I give you an example. We in Africa will suffer the most from all the scenarios I've seen of climate change, if business as usual continues. Our yields will drop by 50%. Our water tables will drop. It, diseases will increase because again of the global warming and the pockets of water. I've seen all the analysis. Now you tell me, should an African not be interested in climate change? Should an African say, oh, it's not me creating the problem, but you pay the worst for something you did not create because somebody else who had the means to do it differently is making it worse. You see where I'm headed. So in all of this discussion, if we do it right and we've done the analysis, if we aggressively address our three targets, it's a development target, but the, one of the biggest core benefits is climate change. Because we change energy systems, we stay within two degrees. But our drive, like you said, the entry point is access. The others are enablers. Efficiency, renewables are enablers. So um, in, in Europe, or in the United States or North America, I'll say for them, it's not access. They can change access and call it energy security. And you can achieve energy security if you still deal with efficiency and you deal with renewables. And guess what? You don't let other poor people suffer for what you are doing because you have, you're so comfortable. So we talk about equity. We talk about stability and peace in the world. In fact, one of the things we don't talk about much, but hopefully in two years we'll begin to talk about, is energy and security. There is a good link. The International Peace Institute and others are working on this. Energy and security, energy and stability, strong link. I mean, isn't that one of the big problems of the world as well? Security and stability. So you begin to see the multi-dimensional nature of energy touching many things. I even call it energy for peace, light as a peace, interregional cooperation to sell and trade energy together, makes you get together. Europe started with coal and other commodities, but coal is energy. Today they have all kinds of interconnection. So in the initiative also we're pushing for Africa. Some have more water, others do not have. You build a dam, you can trade that energy. Some have more biomass. Ah, some are discovering oil and gas, like my good country. Some don't have it, but if we combine, we have interconnections. We begin to trade energy because some of us are also too small. The countries are too small to get an investor interested, but the regional market becomes exciting. There is economies of scale. So you begin to see the many dimensions of energy trade, energy as, as an integrator for peace and stability in communities, but for sure, uh, cooperation and partnership is a core part of sustainable energy for all.